Welcome, friends. You are listening to the Mind Body Alchemy podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Miramontes. This is where intuition meets education in the realms of spirituality, fitness, mindset, and more, all to create lasting change. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited for today's show because I have one of my favorite humans in the whole world joining me today. My client, Amanda, has worked with me for quite a while now, but we became fast friends, and I can't wait for you to get to know her and her story as well, because it's pretty amazing. Welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why don't we get started just by telling my audience a little bit about who you are, if you can get just a little bit of your background and just kind of explain what you have already experienced when it comes to like maybe a, your dieting history and where you're from so they can get to know you a little bit. Sure. Okay. Well, she said, my name is Amanda. I have a extensive dieting history. I've been overweight most of my life. I have lost over a hundred pounds twice in my life. Once when I was a senior in high school and once when I went through divorce about 15 years ago, each time, obviously I'm still on the dieting train. Well, I'm not on the dieting train anymore, but I have been on the dieting train. And each time I gained weight back after high school, I went to college and gained quite a bit of weight through that ex experience. And then I went through trauma, some um, pretty big conflicts in my life, gained some more weight. And then, as I said, I went through divorce and I lost over a hundred pounds in less than six months. I have been on every program known to man, every diet known to man, even under the second time I lost a lot of weight, I was under the consultation of a doctor. And so that was a pretty traumatic experience as well. When you have someone who's encouraging you to eat 800 to a thousand calories, take a lot of supplements and different things like that. So I've done it all. I think that a lot of people will relate to having a similar background, not necessarily losing a hundred pounds a couple of times, but just understanding that they've tried multiple things and had varying levels of success, but that success was always a temporary fix. And then the weight obviously comes right back and usually brings a little bit extra, a few more pounds along with it. And that's, that's something that a lot of my clients and a lot of my listeners, I'm sure, can relate to. So when the weight came back, then you decided to hire me. What was the catalyst for you wanting to change this time? Sort of what was your why at that time? Well, I started to have some health issues and I have children. So... As a single mom with health issues, it was scary to me that where, what was going to happen to my kids if something happened to me. So they, they were a huge why for me. And also, I think I mentioned the second time I lost all that weight, I was under the care of a doctor and I hit a plateau. And his suggestion to me was that I have liposuction. Oh gosh. Well, that was extremely traumatic <laughs> for me <laughs> because I thought to myself, you know, I've done all this work and I started exercising. The, my only option is some type of surgery. That, that just didn't seem right to me. And so uh, I actually had a friend who was involved in competition such type things and so she actually recommended you initially because I've hired you twice so <laughs> that was my catalyst the first time the second time I hired you I really just got to a point where I wanted change in my life I just wanted to be healthy so I was no longer looking for a fix per se to like fix the way I looked, but I really, really, really wanted to, to uh, understand why did, did I continue on this train? And I wanted to understand how could I fix what was going on inside of me. And so we started working together 
and tried a few different approaches. We've tried a few different things leading up to where we are today, which yeah. is the way that I coach all of my clients now, which is just based on building habits and mindset in order to become someone who lives in the body that you want instead of focusing on all the things that you have to do to get there. So right. instead of all of these outside in approaches, like constantly weighing and measuring yourself and controlling your food, we really focus on what does it look like to already be there? What kind of behaviors do you have to have? What kind of habits do you have to have? What happens when you get up in the morning? What happens when you get off work? And that's a really tough thing to get your head around when you're used to having somebody give you a lot of instructions, like a specific diet. When we shifted to habits, how did that make you feel? Were you relieved about that? Did you have your doubts? What went through your head at that point? Well, I thought you had gone a little crazy. <laughs> and I thought, how is this ever going to work? It really was almost a sense of panic initially because I had spent years counting calories, counting points. I did Weight Watchers multiple times, following a plan of some kind putting everything in my fitness pal. And, and I don't mean to say any of these things are bad things, but right. when you make a shift from counting to trusting yourself and kind of getting to know yourself, it was pretty scary for me. And it took some time for me to really wrap my head around, what does this look like? Steph, I don't think you're right. I can't trust myself. <laughs> I have just spent a lot of years gaining and losing. That to me shows me I really can't trust myself because every time I lose, then I want to go out and have some sort of fast food. And obviously I can't trust myself if I still want to eat that. So it was a huge mind shift for me, but undoubtedly the best thing that could have ever happened. I think you brought up such a good point, and of course, I'm so proud to hear you say that, but you said that you had already spent all these years losing and gaining and losing and gaining using systems that were more focused on counting and sort of the typical fitness coach advice, and because you kept losing and gaining on that advice that you for sure couldn't trust yourself that yeah taking a more mindful and intuitive approach would be just so scary that you would maybe never stop eating or completely blow everything that you'd worked for out of the water does that sound right yes absolutely i just thought i will i'll never be able to do this i can't trust myself and I think I've told myself for years, I can't be, you can't be trusted around food. You can't be trusted to make good decisions. I can even remember telling myself or saying probably to you at some point, I can't buy cereal because if I do, I can't eat it responsibly. Or I can't have ice cream in my house. You know, I love ice cream. I can't eat it responsibly. And that's actually not the case. But for certain, when we started down this path, I thought that it was. Yeah. What do you think has been the hardest part of sort of shifting to a more mindful approach? Well, I think just accepting that I am capable. I, I am trustworthy. My body doesn't lie to me. My body can be trusted. My body does know cues. I just had to retrain myself to recognize the cues and trust my body to listen. Your body will lie to you, but there's something on the plate that's your favorite food. Your body might say, you really want to eat that. But in reality, your body's telling you you're full and you just have to listen to that. Maybe it's not really your body saying you really want to eat that. It's really your mind saying, right. this is your favorite food you should eat that. 
right? It yeah. encourages you because all these years, it's my favorite food and I'm going to eat every bite on the plate because it's my favorite right. and I haven't had my favorite in two weeks, so I should eat it. Where your body is saying, you're full, you've had enough, and if you want to eat your favorite again tomorrow, it's okay, you can do that too. So it kind of stems from this scarcity mindset of like, well, I don't know when I'm going to eat this again. And, and if it's on my plate, then I've lost control because this is sort of a bad food. Right. So I better eat it all so that I can get control back tomorrow. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Now that you have practiced bringing some of these foods onto your plate on purpose without that scarcity mindset, what has changed about your thought process toward those foods versus how it was, say, a year or two ago? Well, interestingly enough, it becomes easier um, not to overeat those foods, which seems so counterintuitive. But I had ice cream yesterday, and I had four bites. And I was completely happy because I had the food that I wanted. I put the top on and put it back in the freezer. I was full. I just wanted a little taste and I was good. It feels like, you know, you'll just go crazy, but in reality, accepting that I can eat whatever I want and I'm going to be fine takes away the mindset that you have to eat it all because you don't know when you're going to get it again. You know, like the, when you, you say scarcity in my mind, I think I don't have food available to me. So it was mm -hmm. a con a new concept to learn. It also meant like, I might not, not available could just mean it's not in my house. Not that yeah. I don't have the money to go buy it, but I just have limited it um, to myself and therefore I don't have it available. It's, like a restriction mindset. Yes. And it's interesting to me because I know exactly what you mean by that because I lived the majority of my life that way as well. But as you start to shift your thought process a little bit, you learn that ice cream is just food and it's not a fat gain food. It's not a weight gain food. And so when we want to lose weight, we immediately take sort of inventory of our pantry and go, okay, I need to get rid of all of these fattening foods to use a word from what, like the nineties fattening. I, I don't know <laughs> if anybody uses that anymore, but that was the word in my house <laughs> growing up. But we think about these foods that have high pleasure per bite as the problem. They're the problem. They're the reason we are where we are. They're the cause of the weight gain. They're the cause of our misery. And we were talking earlier, and that's not the problem at all. So when you start adding these things in intentionally, and then you see yourself have success, still being able to include these foods and not restricting anything, that nothing is sort of off the table, so to speak, then you are left with an uncomfortable opportunity to find out what the problem really is. Yeah. No one wants to think they're the problem. And I hate to even say it in that way because I don't feel like I'm the problem per se. I do feel like I learned a lot of habits as I was growing up when I was way too young to be a problem or maybe even, you know, even as I was older, and I think that traumatic experiences played into this, and I had developed coping mechanisms, uh, some of which involve food, which you and I have talked about at times, that's not a bad thing. It right. becomes an unhealthy habit when you don't work on the problems, and you only cope with food and you don't sit with the problem and you don't journal the problem. You don't somehow work through that. So, yeah, I hate to even say, you know, people don't want to recognize that they are the problem because I, I don't want people to hear me say, well, you're the problem and you've got to solve something. It really right. is. You just have to understand yourself. You have to understand how you became this way. And I told, like you said, we were talking earlier and I said to you, this has been so eye-opening for me. And even now, you know, I shared with you, I've been with my family 
quite a bit in the last week and a half. And I see now <laughs> how I developed a lot of these habits. And it's much different to say, you have a problem, you need to fix it, than it is to say, why well, I've developed certain habits because I was trained this way and my body and my brain go to the habits instantly because it's what they know. Now let me retrain that. That's a yeah. much different thing. And it doesn't feel as heavy as I have a problem and I have to fix it. Yes. Agreed. It's never your fault or anyone's fault on like the truest level, because the reality is we have all been exposed to diet culture, which says that you need to be in control and you need to try to force your body to do all of these things. And it has villainized everything from sugar to carbohydrates, to fats, yeah. to protein, to, you know, everything that you could possibly imagine has been villainized by one diet or another. So all of it is very confusing. And even if you pick up on those things, even if you never dieted or it was never your thing, your parents probably did. And your grandparents probably did up to certain points. They have absorbed and taken in some of this information on some level and their example passes it on, even if they don't ever sit you down and say, now, Amanda, don't ever eat ice cream. It's bad for you. The yeah. way that they behave around it on a young, impressionable brain is going to, it's going to make an impact. And then, you know, and then you're just fighting an uphill battle because you think that, you know, my mom said this was bad. And then you grow up and you don't think it's bad. You think it's freaking delicious. And so then you have this problem that you have no willpower or you have no self-control and it becomes this moral issue that you are somehow this big failure when in reality, you just got poor information. Yeah. And not only, I know you use diet culture as one example, but even our medical culture or medical environment. You know, I, I shared with you about my doctor who said, well, you just need to have liposuction. And I can remember yeah. when I went on, I guess I'll call it the biggest diet I went on when I was in high school. I and mean, I lost, you know, all that weight. I can't remember my mom sharing with me that she had a doctor tell her she should eat lettuce and vinegar. If you're hungry, you should eat lettuce and vinegar <laughs> because vinegar will help if you are retaining water and lettuce has no calories. So, <laughs> and that yeah. was from a doctor. That's terrible advice on both accounts. It you is know? terrible I didn't advice. Need liposuction and I don't need to eat vinegar and lettuce. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you separate the medical field from diet culture and I see them as one and the same. The medical field has been so steeped in diet culture, they are actually very poorly educated for the most part, unless they seek out that education on their own about solid nutrition. And nutrition is fairly young in its research. So they, they're giving out advice based on what they heard or what yeah. they read in a ridiculous book or a you know what their grandma told them. So we look at them as sort of these know-all people when it comes to health and our well-being, when in reality, they're subject to the same amount of nonsense that we are and just pass it off because they have some level of authority because of their status, because of their position. Yeah. And that makes it actually more problematic. Yeah, I agree with you. And I actually didn't consider that, but you're right. I mean, they've been given a pyramid or some study that says we need to walk a certain number of steps a day or, you know, whatever the fact is, but just even, and I didn't share this part of my story in the beginning, but I also have hormonal issues and the same doctor who put me on the 800 calorie a day diet also took me on and off thyroid medicine. So he discovered that my, I had a, underactive thyroid, put me on the medicine, and three months later would test me and say, my medicine, your thyroid is looking great. You don't need the medicine anymore. 
yeah. which is like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> <laughs> Your thyroid's so, looking great because of the medicine. <laughs> correct. <laughs> it's a really good point that just because somebody has positioned themselves as an authority, oh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're as well-rounded as maybe they're either teaching that they are, showing that they are, or that we as consumers go around expecting them to know or assuming that they know because we don't know any better. So somebody must, and let's look to our healthcare providers to provide us with help. <laughs> so yeah. we assume that they, that they know all the things when that's not accurate at all. That's a whole different rabbit hole that we could definitely go down sometime in the future probably. But to your point, diet culture is everywhere including from the people who are supposed to be caring for our health. One of the things that we've talked about is that it's not a personal failure for, for anyone, but it's all the different information that is collected from all the different sources. One person might collect that information and do something completely different where you might collect it and it impacts you a certain way. And so you end up with two very different experiences just based on how you collected the information, how that information actually made you feel, where someone might be able to roll something off their shoulders like it's no big deal and it doesn't stick in their brain. If somebody hits a nerve with you, it might be extremely impactful or hurtful or give you some motivation to do something different. And all of those things lead up to sort of who we are and the habits that we take with us from day-to-day -day life. And our collection of habits is what ends up with our results. So when it comes to your habits now, can you give us a before and after on how you used to behave versus how you behave now? What are some of the things that surprised you about yourself, the, th the changes you've made that you didn't really see yourself being this kind of person or you didn't see that in the past version of you that you are now? Sure. Well, I would say I'm night and day, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I can give you quite a few examples. We went through you know, forming habits. I remember one day you said to me, you're an athlete. And I was shocked that you would call me an athlete. But when I really went back to examine what my habits were, you know, I used to exercise basically because you told me to <laughs> and because it was on a plan or because, you know, someone said it was a good idea. But what I actually right. came to learn is that there are types of exercise that I actually really love. I love to lift weights. I love to lift weights. I feel empowered by it. I love to watch the weight grow on the end of the bar. <laughs> and I just feel, it makes me feel outside of physically strong. It makes me feel mentally strong that I can do that. And that was really shocking to me. And I've developed a love of running, which I don't know if I would go so far to say, you know, I'm a runner as in I'm going to run marathons. But I am a runner because I'm teaching myself to run. And it's something that I really enjoy. I like to get outside. I like to be a part of nature. And I really enjoy doing that. Outside of that, I just look for ways now I'm able to separate exercise per se, as in I'm going to do this because it's on a plan versus I just like to move my body. And that's comfortable yeah. for me. And I enjoy it much more than I enjoy sitting in a chair all day or on the couch all day. So that's been a huge shift for me. I also have really surprised myself by the types of foods that I enjoy. I think for so long, I had this limited diet that either, yes, I could eat this or no, I couldn't. And I still enjoyed a lot of these foods that fell into the no, I couldn't category, but I didn't really allow myself to explore. Um, so a couple months ago, I decided for the health benefits, I wanted to eat more vegetables. And I, I use a vegetable service um, that delivers a box to me every Tuesday. And I've tried tons of things that I would never eat, purple potatoes, and I love mangoes, and 
peas. I always grew up thinking I hated peas because what I learned was that I just didn't like the way they were cooked, but I actually love peas. So now when I make my plate, I always have two, three, sometimes four vegetables on there because it's something I enjoy, not because oh, I can't eat anything else. And so I'm going to put the vegetables on there. You know, it used to be when I had a, a meal plan, there would be the protein I was going to eat, the carbs I was going to eat, the fats I was going to eat. And then it would say optional vegetables. I never ate them. If they were optional, why do I need them? That I love them. So I've, I've changed a lot of my habits. Another thing that I've really, really worked hard on and really has surprised myself with is self-talk. I said the most unkind, ugliest things to myself almost minute by minute throughout the day that I could possibly say. And one thing you always say to me that was so eye-opening is, would you say that to one of your girls? I have, you know, teenage daughters. Would you say that to one of them? Or would you say that to someone else? And the answer was always no. I would never berate anyone else the way I berated myself. And so that's something I've worked really, really hard on changing. And I didn't think I would be okay enough with who I am to allow myself to change that. And that has been really eye-opening to me that I really am. Uh, I can like myself and still make progress. And that has also been a huge mind shift for me as well. So it, it's, there's a lot I could go on. So what I don't want people to miss about what you just said was that you didn't feel like you could be okay enough with yourself to be kind to yourself. And I think a lot of people can relate to that because usually we think, I'll be nice to myself when, when I have the job, when I make enough money, when I lose the weight, when I fall in love, when, when, when. And up until that point, you deserve no self-worth, no personal love. Sure, you can receive it from other people maybe, you know, okay, my mom can love me, okay, my child can love me, but I'm not going to love myself because I'm not where I think I should be. I don't measure up. And we end up not treating ourselves kindly because of that. And how can you build habits that are healthy? How can you eat nutritious food as a priority? How can you exercise as a priority? Do your journaling and your self-care if you don't feel like you're worth the effort. Yeah, I think it's sold to us as pushing yourself to be better. Yeah, I think that's what society tells us that it is, but it just creates continual self-doubt in you because if you don't achieve whatever that goal is in the way your mind has set out that it should be achieved, right. then you just continually self-doubt yourself. You know, one of the things that I get pushed back on all the time is, well, Steph, if I accept myself and I love myself for who I am now, then I'll just quit and I won't want to lose weight or I won't want to do this. My first thought is, okay, and like, isn't that the whole point that you don't <laughs> want to torture yourself into a different version? Like, isn't the whole point to be happy? But also, yes, you absolutely will. You don't give up on yourself when you love yourself more. You care for yourself when you love yourself more just like any other relationship, the more love there is there, that doesn't mean that you're happy with everything that other person does or that you like every single thing about their personality or their habits or behaviors, but you're there for them no matter what because you love them. And that's what I feel like every client and every person really needs to take away from all of this is that, you know, show up for yourself first be absolutely compassionate and unconditionally love who you are so that you do feel worthy of your own time, your own attention yeah. and your own self-care. Yeah. Self-care, you know, that would be another thing I would say has, I never had self, I never uh, used self-care. I saw it as being selfish before I started this process. And when I first started practicing self-care, I felt really guilty about it 
But you're right. If you don't practice self-care, number one, you can't really give to others if you don't practice the self-care for yourself, but you also don't see yourself as worthy. And so that was a hard switch for me and sometimes can still be something that I really have to pay attention to and really intentional on because, you know, we have four kids. I have a husband. We are active in our church and community and things like that. So it's hard to really say, I'm taking a time out here. I'm going to spend 30 minutes journaling or I'm going to buy myself a new outfit or I'm going to take a bubble bath. It's something I like to do for self-care. Whatever it is, and I also think not to get on a self-care soapbox, if you will, but I think a lot of times we are told from society that self-care has to cost money, but it doesn't. Part of my act of self-care is eating healthy and exercising because I'm caring for my body. And that, that was a huge mind shift for me because those were actually things I used to do to punish myself. Like that's how I viewed it. But in reality, I love myself enough to take care of myself and to move my body because it's what's best for my body. And that's a big, you know, game changer as well. Yeah. I think that that's, that needs to be highlighted as well is that the things you do for self-care now are the things you used to do to punish yourself. Yeah. And nothing has changed as far as, okay, eating healthy, either way, exercising, either way, but the mindset shift of... Like, instead of thinking, I'm going to do this just to shrink myself, it's, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do because it makes me feel good. And you notice the feel good changes. Whereas before people think I'm going to get my pleasure from taking a break from my diet, or I'm going to, I'm going to take a day off. I'm going to take a cheat day or a cheat meal or whatever. And since I took away every opportunity for you to cheat because there's no such thing with the way that I coach. You can no longer, (laughs) you can no longer go down that road. You don't need a cheat day or a cheat meal because you don't cheat on yourself. Instead, you enjoy those kinds of foods freely. And I literally mean freely. If one day you want four bites of ice cream, awesome. If one day you eat half a pint, also awesome because you are aware of what you're doing you're paying attention, you're mindful about it, and you're making a decision instead of feeling like you're just out of control. Yeah. And exercise, I do agree with that. And, you know, not only food, but exercise as well. I remember a few months ago, I said to you, I'm just tired. And I don't think I, and I love lifting weights. I've already, you know, shared that, but I said, I don't think I can lift weights one more day. And your response was, well, don't take a week off, take two weeks off, do some yoga, do something that's restorative, do something else, but you don't have to lift weights. And I did. And I was great. You know, that was an act of self-care. Yes. My body was telling me you need to rest. And I did. Yeah. And it didn't mean I'm never going to lift weights again. And that's the key right there. For so many people that take a rules-based approach to their transformation, it's like, well, if I break the rule and I break it for a day or two days or five days or whatever, it's on or it's off. Instead of thinking in an intuitive way where it's like, okay, you know what? Right now, work is really stressful. My family has a lot going on. This weightlifting thing is not my favorite. My body is saying no, but that doesn't mean that then you throw your habits out the window. That's not what you did. You traded it. You get curious. What can I do instead? And that was just it. How can I be restorative? Because obviously my body's asking for restoration. Now, yeah, we can kid ourselves and we can say, well, you know, my body's just asking for a whole gallon of ice cream. And no, it's not. Absolutely not. You're giving into your stress eating or your emotional eating, or you're just burnt out. 
And, but you need to start asking questions. How can I still honor my values as someone who takes care of themselves while also honoring what my body is asking of me, which is to take a softer approach for, you know, like you said, a week or two weeks or even a day or two, you know, sometimes it's just about getting some extra rest. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. There's so much in between that point of 100% on and forget about it. I don't care. Yeah. I used to really freak out about going on vacation Mm -hmm. and I would pack my weights with me for several years. I did that and I would meal prep and I would take food and I would worry, you know, can I freeze this? So by the time I drive six hours to the beach, it will have defrosted, but it won't be bad. You know, all these things. I just went on vacation. I did not pack a single weight. I didn't plan a single meal. What I did was I relied on my habits. Every plate I fixed had multiple vegetables on it. And I, you know, we, we, um, practiced taking 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to eat a meal. I religiously do that. So I did that every single meal. I had people around me who were very fast eaters. It did not deter me. I was not, you know, I recognize that they are fast eaters because I've been taking so long to eat my meals. 15 minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but I would highly recommend that you set a clock and see how quickly you eat your meals (laughs) because you will be done in five minutes or less and you will have felt like you took 15 minutes. But I felt great at the end of my vacation. I didn't have any type of, you know, my clothes don't fit or, you know, there, there was nothing that I, I didn't feel guilty about anything. I didn't feel like I need to go out and run on the beach because I now ate something that I wouldn't normally eat. I didn't have any type of negative emotion t- uh, tied to going on vacation and not meal prepping and not counting anything and not tracking my steps or any of those things because I really do trust myself. I'm not perfect. I still have days um, where I I struggle from time to time, but in large, I really do trust myself now. And I do feel like my body is going to tell me what I need when I need it. And it's going to help me ultimately get to what I would call the optimal weight. Yeah. I'm not there today, but I do believe I'll get there. Whatever that is. I don't have a weight in mind. Just for the record. Great success. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's just one of those places where you live the, a lifestyle that is doable for you, right? I stretch you. I challenge you all the time and say, you know what? Let's, let's look at this. Let's track this. Let's have a conversation around these things. And, and you do have to put in effort, right? I don't want anybody to think, well, it's just habits. Habits are hard as hell to break and to create. Whoever said it's 21 days, that is nonsense. It is not 21 days, um, especially when it's undoing programming from years and years and years. And it comes to something as emotional, cultural, societal as your food intake. It's, you know, it takes a lot of time to build these habits and behaviors. But I, I think it's really important that you said, you know, I'm not perfect because there's no such thing. But you do trust yourself, which is a far cry from where you started. And I would love to bring up that at one point you asked me, Steph, how am I ever going to do this on my own and trust that I'm capable to, to just maintain it or that I can live this way? Like, I don't see a lifestyle for me. And then, you know, we, we moved into these habits and behaviors and I would love to know if if that question still stands the same way. (laughs) No, it definitely doesn't. And I remember saying that to you and I remember feeling when I said that just flabbergasted, like I'm never going to get there, but I definitely don't feel that way today. I really don't. And it does take time for you to really recognize that the habits have taken hold, if you will, that they really are habits. 
and sometimes you shift. I mean, I've had this happen. You shift, you think you have a habit down and you shift away to something else that you want to work on. And you realize, hey, wait a minute, I need to go back to this other habit because I thought I was good there, but it really, as soon as I turn my focus to something else, it's, it's not as easy as what it was when I was focusing on it. So therefore the habit hasn't really it's there. You just need to focus on it a little longer so that it becomes your normal. But I would definitely say I see this as my lifestyle now. I mean, if I can go on vacation and maintain this, I don't know how much more of a lifestyle it can be, right? Vacations, no. <laughs> holidays, things like that are all the things that people will say, oh, it threw me off track. I have to start again Monday. I don't have to start anything again Monday. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, there is it no was, Monday anymore. There's no correct. start over. Yes. The more restriction that people experience in diets, usually on the other side of that is binge eating and emotional eating and feeling out of control around food. Do you feel you experienced any of that? I think I was both of those things. I was definitely an emotional eater. I ate when I was happy and when I was sad and when I was angry, <laughs> when I was disappointed, I, I used all of those emotions to eat. And when I did that, I was a binge eater. It took me a long time to realize I wasn't those things anymore, but I definitely showed all those symptoms and all those signs, if you will, and I, as I said earlier, I've been through uh, quite a bit of trauma in my life. And I do think at times when you can't control anything else, people will turn to food because it's the one thing you can control, what you put in and what you take out. When I was going through divorce, it, and there was a lot of things out of control in my life, that was, it was easy for me. I had a plan. And a lot of people will probably think, well, how do you only eat 800 calories? Weren't you starving? I wasn't. I was good because I did exactly what I was told to do. And the outcome, I was achieving the outcomes that then I would use to make myself feel better for all of the mm -hmm. trauma that was going on around me. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely would have categorized myself as those things, but not anymore for certain. Yeah. One of the things that I tried to make sure I communicate to people is that these identity labels can be dangerous because we identify as an emotional eater or as a binge eater. And so to change those things is kind of like trying to cut off your own arm. It's part of who you are, so it's impossible. But when we can change the language around it and say, I experience emotional eating, or I experience binge eating or something like that, then it's a, an experience that you have or a behavior that you can start to look at and examine and decide, you know what, I don't want this to take control over me anymore. I don't want to be powerless around food. And therefore, it's not who I am. It's just something that we're working on. And then I think that that feels a little bit less triggering, I guess. It feels a little bit less frustrating and it feels a little bit hopeless when you identify as something, then it's, you know, something's wrong with me instead right. of it's something that I've done. Do you feel that these habit shifts and behavior changes have trickled down to your family and the way that you guys interact at home or has there been any impact there? I do. I didn't create these habits for myself. I learned them from someplace. And if I don't recognize what these unhealthy habits are, then I just pass them down to my kids. I have four teenagers and I don't want them to have the same struggles that I've had. So I think it's really important that I recognize the habits that I don't want to pass down and replace them with habits that I do want to pass down. And I've worked really, really hard at that because I don't want any of them to have a negative body image. And so I don't want them to feel, you know, the way I felt or the way I have felt for a really long time. I think my first memory of a negative body image is when I was about four or five and I am now 42. That's a long time to carry around <laughs> yeah. a negative body image. 
It really so. is. <laughs> it really is. And, and I can relate to it. I went through the same thing. I was very young. I knew from a very young age that there was something wrong with my body, that my body wasn't the right body, the most acceptable body, the pretty body. And it took a lot of years and a lot of trial and error and undoing and learning and mostly personal development work, really working on my habits, my mindset, having my own back to change that narrative. And I think that's what, one of the reasons why I do what I do in this way instead of just having people, you know, do the typical fitness stuff because I don't want you to just walk away with a smaller body. I want you to walk away with a big life. You know, I, I want you to just take up as much space as possible in your life. And your body is usually because of your habits, there will be a direct result from that. Yeah. And you know, when we talked about earlier about the problem, you know, when you take away the food, what's the problem? And people, and I said, you know, I don't want to call myself or people the problem. It speaks to that. It's just your habit, you yeah. know, and you can reduce it to the habit and, and attack that, if you will. You're no longer attacking yourself. When you feel yes. like you're the problem, well, now it leads to, I have to fix me. Well, we don't, and we can't, if, <laughs> truthfully. Um, and I have to tell myself about all the things that I'm doing that just continue to lead to the problem. You know, it leads to that negative self-talk. If you continue to look at yourself as the problem, yeah. it's your behavior, it's your mindset. And I even hate to, to say it's a problem. It's not that. You just need to adjust it. And you need to look at it and you need to recognize, well, is this the mindset? Is this behavior one I want to keep? You say that often, you know, or do I need to reframe this? Do I want it to change it in some way? Is it the value that I want to hold concerning my health? That's a much different mindset than I'm of the problem. I just don't have the motivation. You said that earlier. I don't have the willpower. Um, right. I've made a mistake. I have to start over. You don't just start over. You just have to continue. <laughs> That's, I, I think that that's a great lesson to end on. There is no starting over. And every time that we, quote, make a mistake, it's just a learning opportunity. It's just asking yourself, am I happy with the way I dealt with that? If yes, great. If not, how would I prefer to do it instead? Instead of beating yourself up, just gather information, right? And then we just you, change it. You always say to me, it's just data. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is not a personal thing. You did not somehow fail at life because you overate in this environment or during that circumstance or because the food was just too good and you wanted too many bites or you ate too quickly. Those are not personal failures, yeah. but something definitely led up to the circumstance, whether it was your environment or stress or emotions or whatever. And then we can just look at that and no one is getting it right 100% of the time. And I think that's important too. When you have to follow a certain number of calories or macros or something like that, there, there is a failure there. It's like, okay, well, you didn't do it this way, so you failed. And it's different when you're doing self-inquiry. It's not a failure. It's just like, huh, it's a curiosity. You get to be curious with yourself and just go, why did I do that? That's interesting. That was an interesting reaction to my boss slamming my door or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, you could just look at it a little bit different. Yeah, but you also have to be prepared to develop some self-awareness. Yep. You, you have to be able to uh, deal with understanding the why of why you did something. And that can be challenging you know, if you realize you just ate a whole pint of ice cream because you watched a TV show where someone was abusive and you were in an abusive relationship at some point, you have to be prepared to be able to make that tie in and then deal with whatever feelings you have and realizations you have from that uh, discovery. So. You're absolutely right about that. You have to be willing to not just look at the behavior, but to ask the questions and experience 
the answers, experience the reality so that you're prepared the next time that you get in that situation. And I think that that's where compassion really comes in. You have to be able to give yourself some space and some grace around things that you have identified as bad or wrong about you or your behaviors or how you act or your lack of willpower. None of that is a deal breaker at life. There is no, there is no failing at, at, at food. How ridiculous of a concept to think that we can fail at food. It's necessary for our survival. So, and the fact that it tastes good and that it does spike dopamine and it does light up the pleasure centers of our brain, that tells us something, right? It's not (laughs) just this fuel that we should just completely control. There's a reason that it can do the things that it can do. And having that awareness and, and acknowledging that will help us to be curious and, and move forward and make sure that our values are in place. Like you said, is that a value you want for your life? And if not, what can you do? How can we start to shift it? How can we start to reframe it? So you're not beating up your own personal moral compass, right? You're not making you wrong. It's just a circumstance. It's just what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amanda, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We had some major hiccups with audio and things like that, but I'm excited to get this out into the world. I think your story is going to help a lot of people and, and I can't wait to publish it. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks for being a great coach because this has been a long journey and I will forever be grateful for the journey that we've had together. Oh, thank you. Means the world. (laughs) (laughs) that's it for me today I hope you guys got something out of this please screenshot it tag me on social media leave me a rating and review and I will see you next week bye